This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. You are the leader in the courtroom, and you want the jury to be looking to you for the answers. When you figure out your theory, never deviate. You want the facts to be consistent, complete, and credible. The defense has no problem running out the clock. Delay is the friend of the defense. It's tough to grow a firm by trying to hold on and micromanage. You've got to front load a simple structure for jurors to be able to hold on to. What types of creative things can we do as lawyers, even though we don't have a trial setting? Whatever you've got to do to make it real, you've got to do to make it real. But the person who needs convincing is you. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, I'm very happy to have our newly minted partner at our firm and a great lawyer, uh, Laura Porter. How are you doing today, Laura? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. It's your first time on the podcast. Yes. No one told you when you made partner, you had to (laughs) not just, uh, you know, handle cases and manage people, but you also had to jump in on the podcast from time to time. Yes, I'm excited. I'm excited to do it. Well, great. Well, I've loved practicing with you the last few years, and uh, I'd like our audience to get to know you a little bit. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm from South Texas and Florida. My family moved from Florida to Texas when I was in high school. We moved to McAllen, Texas, which is located near the U.S.-Mexico border in the Rio Grande Valley. I graduated from high school in McAllen and attended the University of Texas Pan American in Edinburgh, Texas, and graduated from there. After college, I moved to San Antonio, Texas to attend law school at St. Mary's University, and I've lived in San Antonio ever since. So, you know, I have one thing in common. We grew up on the Texas-Mexico, where you, at least you went to high school and college uh, on the Texas-Mexico border. And yes. Uh, about 60 miles apart. Now, I'm older than you, so I was long gone by the time you got there. But uh, I think that gives you a different perspective. I agree. I agree. I love the Rio Grande Valley, and um, my parents are there. Love to go back there and see friends. I did attempt to go back there to work after law school, but there were just more opportunities. The firm that I had been clerking at all through law school offered me a job, and so I I stayed in San Antonio. And basically, before you came to us, you had worked at one firm for how long? Yes. So since after my first summer of law school, I started working at Lyons and Rhodes at the time. And uh, later on, it became Tom Rhodes Law Firm, and I worked there from goodness, let's see, approximately 1999 until after Tom passed away. And um, I'm, you know, just sort of monitoring anything that's still out there for the firm. That's incredibly, that's one of the things that I admired about you is that a lot of us jump around from job to job and you you find a place and stuck to it. And they also stuck with you they uh, did. for the whole time. And, that, you know, that's a, it was a very high performing law firm. Yes. Uh, very, you know, nationally known, big case, big, big verdict. Yes, firm. yes. So mm-hmm. what are some things that you've learned through the, that first part of your journey working uh, with Tom Rhodes and his firm that has served you well? Um, you know, attention to detail is important, but also Tom used to say, just keep swimming. Just sort of roll. <laughs> Don't let things set you off track. Just continue to push forward. You know, we will have setbacks, but just keep pushing forward. And so that's what I've tried to do. Just keep a a forward progressing momentum. I think that's so important because we all have ups and downs during a lawsuit. I mean, very rarely do you have a case where you win every single hearing, every deposition goes perfectly. Every moment in the trial is, is exactly the way you, you dreamt that it would be. Typically, you know, the other side gets to play, too. And, you know, they, they don't just lay on their back and give up. They fight back. Uh, exactly. And I think that, that learning how to not give up but keep going, mm-hmm. uh, knowing that we're hitting them, too, yes, uh, is so important. Now, there, did you, 
was it more like each lawyer had their own docket or was it more of like a team approach? It was more of a team approach. And so, you know, as a young lawyer, that's helpful to see how older, more experienced lawyers handle cases. And, and so I worked primarily with Tom and, you know, we would approach things from a, a team uh, aspect. We would have meetings and develop a litigation plan and, you know, litigate cases that way. What were some of the cool cases you worked on while you were there? Well, definitely, you know, um, nursing home abuse cases, medical malpractice cases, cases with, you know, uh, brain injuries in both children um, and adults. And so just those that really stuck with me, you know, I remember the cases I take them on, you know, almost in a, in a personal manner. So I enjoy people. I enjoy meeting clients. And so I like to um, have that relationship with them to help try and make them as whole as we can from whatever situation they've found themselves in. If I remember right, you got to work with a couple of our prior podcast guests. I think you work with both Hans Poppy and Randy McGinn on different cases. Yes. Yes, I did. Tell me Uh, about that. Well, I worked more closely with Randy McGinn on a case in New Mexico. And, um, you know, that was exciting to see uh, how she approaches things. You know, there aren't as many women trial lawyers. And so I really, you know, was excited by the opportunity to work with her, not only her, but also her partners, Alicia Montoya, also to see how they, you know, worked up cases and they just have a great, great office and a great environment. So I was, you know, excited to get to work with them. Did you get to go to trial? We did. So what's it like trying a case with Randy McGinn? She, you know, has her own style. I can't say that, you know, I I just really watched her, you know, and and we would have meetings to decide who was going to do what. And so, you know, each one of us knew what our role was, you know. Any takeaways from watching Randy try case things that we could we could try to learn and adopt in our lives? Um, I really liked the way she spoke to the jury. Um, She has a really good presence. And it was interesting to me, you know, when she would look at the jury and when she would look away. And so it really captivated the jurors and, and, you know, anybody who was watching. Um, And I think that that is really important. Having a good presentation manner, it instills, I think, confidence and also comfort. Watching her and seeing the evidence being produced, it was just an overall positive you know, experience. She brought her approach to trial and Tom and our team brought our approach to trial and the teams worked together well. How were the approaches different? That's a good question. Being that I had worked with Tom for so long, his approach was just second nature, you know, to me in my evaluation, he sort of set the standard as to what, you know, what is done. Whereas Randy came at it from a, a different perspective Tom felt visuals were were very important. Randy also felt visuals were very important. You know, I I think that was one of the most important parts was that, you know, a lot of times we do need to use visuals when presenting a case. It can make things more clear. And especially if there's some back and forth nature to it, you've got to have a visual to anchor what you're saying and to try and anchor the facts of the case. What are some of the visuals you all used? A calendar to try and show what was done when. And uh, was it a nursing home case where they didn't do what they were supposed to do? Or what kind of case was it? No, it was a, a hospital case. And I don't know how much I can. Okay. Know. I don't want to, I don't want to cause problems. Yeah. Okay. So how long had you worked, you know, at the Rhodes firm before you came with us? I believe it was over 16 years. And so you had to then transition from working on a team to handling your own docket and leading a team, what were some of the challenges in in making that transition? Right. Well, as I had gotten older uh, and, and more experienced at Tom's firm, I did have more, I guess you'd say, control uh, over the docket and more management of the docket. Um, so, you know, that wasn't foreign, but I didn't have my own legal assistant. I mean, I, I, I shared a legal assistant. And so... I didn't have the same structure that I have here um, at Callan Rodriguez Peacock. And so I have felt growth (laughs) in uh, both uh, the types of cases that we've handled, as well as I have more support staff. 
and uh, other people helping. And so, you know, having to be the leader that I would want is really what I try to do when I approach a meeting as far as being mindful of people's time, trying not to have things drag on. Not that other people do, but that's just the standard that I've set for myself as I want to try and make it as efficient and meaningful of a period of time as possible when we do meet. Uh, then you've also had to learn a new area of law. I mean, it's been personal injury, but you went from more professional I mean, medical negligence. I think you had some mass tort type stuff. Now moving to you know mostly trucking and commercial vehicle wrecks. Mm-hmm. What did you do to master just a whole new area of law? Well, um, I did get to have a little bit of exposure at Tom's firm uh, with some of those, but definitely not to the degree that I've had here. Um, and really just this firm, Cowan Rodriguez Peacock, providing a lot of uh, educational information uh, to get myself ready. Also, I have an excellent legal assistant who's been doing similar type of personal injury work for a really long time. Um, and so, you know, to some extent, it's, you know, just regular lawyering skills, you know, that yeah. you have that you develop and you just, you know, apply them to a new area in the law. I think there's nothing harder than medical negligence. I mean, even without tort reform, when I mean, people give doctors the benefit of the doubt. So you have to find a way to simplify complex issues. You have to find a way to work with science, with literature, with medicine. And I think it's just like you know, Joe Freed and I both came from a heavy product liability background. We had to do similar things, and, and we'd both done medical negligence before, too. And I think that made us better trucking lawyers. I think that's probably the same for you, that you, you when you bring this, instead of trying to treat it like a big car wreck, you're, you're still treating it like, a, I think Tom Rhodes once called it a nursing home on wheels. You know, they still gotcha. have all the paperwork. They still have. Yes, yes. I would agree that I, I think you're right in that with our cases, you want to provide a, a simple direct case to a jury. And so, you know, that helps you narrow the issues and pick your battles, so to speak. Absolutely. One of the things I've noticed in you in the last, you know, three years is just an increase in confidence in your own decision making. I mean, when you started, you much more wanted to get everyone else's input before making a decision. And now I, I think you still seek collaboration when it is needed. But you're a lot stronger on just making a decision or listening to a couple of people and then going with it and not second guessing yourself. What do you think you've done to grow that part of yourself, that confidence, that decision making? As I'm, 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 it's impressive and I've, I've loved seeing that growth and I was just wanting to hear it from your point of view. Is there anything we did that helped you get the confidence to make your own decision and just stick with it and, and, and move forward? I think that the firm has been very supportive as far as providing the information, the skills and the tools that we need to make the the best decisions for our clients. So I, I find that helpful in allowing me to not second guess myself and to go into a situation with confidence. Good. What are some things we've done specifically that, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm saying that partially for our guests so they get something concrete out of this and partially for myself to know, mm-hmm. you know, I, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd like to duplicate your success with other people. I would like to see, yeah. okay, I, I have my gut feeling about what I think worked with Laura, but I, I haven't really, it's kind of embarrassing. I haven't asked you now <laughs> until we're now on the, on the air doing it in person. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that really is helpful is we did the JJ Keller training and uh-huh. I feel that that put me on equal footing with a lot of our drivers uh, in our cases. And so having that body of knowledge, I think is helpful. Also just having worked on other cases of this type, the more of this type of case that that I handle, the more confidence I have when they're concluded successfully, you know? Uh, And so I think it just builds. I like our case valuation roundtables that we have. I think it's important to hear different people's perspectives on a case and the, the value that they think a case either has or doesn't have. And so that then when we go into a mediation or a negotiation, we've already heard 
people's varying opinions on it. So it just allows us to come in with a more prepared mindset to counter other arguments or just to to know how to deal with issues before they're presented to the clients too, so that we can already diffuse any issues that that may come up during the mediation that might sidetrack us or our clients. Yeah, and just for the listeners, the J.J. Keller training, the J.J. Keller is a company that provides safety and training material and literature to companies, uh, and they have a J.J. Keller training.com as one where we just had all of our lawyers go through the video training series that truck drivers should go through it in a reasonably prudent company uh, so that we'd be armed with what a better feel for what the rules are. It's one thing to try to look stuff up. It's about, it's another to, you know, just get the kind of training that we're supposed to have. And then our, you've mentioned our, our round tables. How does, how often do we have those and how do those work? I mean, I know the answer, but I'm just wanting you to. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a round table each week for an hour during the lunch hour, people present cases, um, We are usually provided information uh, in advance about the cases so we can do a little bit of research uh, about the case and provide information about the medical bills and the injuries and the liability. You know, everything that you would have on the table to consider at a mediation. Then we present our case to the other members of the firm and we talk about what value we believe it has and um, go from there. Yeah, I found that they've been really helpful. One is that when we need, you know, like when the meter says, well, they didn't bring that kind of money. That's all they have. When we've, when you've got the group behind you that we all decided that if the case is worth at least this much, if they don't offer at least this much, we're going to walk away. It's so much easier to walk away. Exactly. And I think our values have increased. But the other thing I think where it's helped is, Every now and then you get a lawyer that just falls in love with the case and they get blinders on. And, you know, the case kind of sucks. And, you know, it's not a good use of our time and effort. And it needs to be settled for what that case is worth, not for what we wish it was worth. Exactly. Um, and that's, you know, not that common. I, I'm, I'm getting better at saying no to bad cases and an intake, but it still happens. And I think that that, that has been eye-opening for people, too, to realize I think it's also been liberating for people to realize we want to maximize very, very case, which means we want to get the most that that particular case is worth. And just because one person gets, let's say, $10 million on their case doesn't mean that your case that you're working on is worth $10 million. It may, it may be a $30,000. It may be a great recovery on that case. And treating them as they need to be treated is the right thing for the client because taking that case to trial is not necessarily in the client's best interest. Right. You had asked about educational offerings that the firm has provided that have helped create more confidence in me. The big rig boot camps that you offer are also very, very useful and educational. I think that's really important. And also, you know, our our firm continuing education uh, opportunities that we have weekly, I think those are really important where you would uh, present to us different issues that we can anticipate. And I found those very helpful in, you know, responding to motions and, you know, just really equipping us with the tools that we need to to be the lawyers that we want to be. Yeah, I realized about three, four years ago that we were holding defendants to a standard as far as training and accountability that we weren't meeting ourselves and decided we needed to try to change that. So we started doing our Friday trainings, the case valuation roundtable. Actually, that's an idea that Tim Mackey from Vista Consulting, mm-hmm. another former podcast guest, gave me years ago, and I just never implemented it until more, a, a couple of years ago. And a lot of times you hear it and just not, you're not ready for it yet. Like you get this mm-hmm. great advice. But you just, you're not at your point in your life or your career where you can take that advice yet. And I, like my wife, I'm glad I met my wife when I met her. If I had met her five years earlier, it probably wouldn't have dated me, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> my husband uh, says that about me, that had I known him in his younger years, I would not have dated that's him. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. So, you know, we, and, and the same with laws, that we have to be at a point, you know, there's, 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 there's progression, there's steps, and we have to... Sometimes just put something in the parking lot until we're ready to use it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't do everything at once. I mean, we've, we've been through a lot of ups and downs at this firm to try to get where we are, and we're still not perfect. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 
or send an email to delisi at cowanlaw.com. That's D-E-L-I-S-I at cowanlaw.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. And now, back to the show. You know, I want you to be free to be perfectly honest uh, on this. Is there anything we could have done better that maybe we didn't do as well as we could on developing you up on increasing your confidence that maybe made it harder for you? You know, I, I can't think of anything as I sit here. I know that having other lawyers within the firm who were willing to um, provide me guidance, share outlines, share resources, that really helped me initially, you know, get moving forward um, as I was making that transition from, you know, my prior law firm to this law firm and this type of case is really the the lawyers in, within the firm helped and they really provided me that. So, you know, and at the time I had to seek it out. It wasn't just offered, but once I asked for it, it was willingly given. And so that would be the one thing, I guess, to maybe lawyers who are starting out or, or starting in a new firm, I would say, you know, find other lawyers who are seasoned or who at least been doing, you know, the type of work that you're seeking to do for a longer period than you have and see if they have, you know, forms that they're willing to share with you, uh, outlines are willing to share with you, resources that they're willing to share with you, um, because those really can make all the difference. And I guess, you know, we have another lawyer starting next month. I guess we should, to welcome her, maybe go out of her way to let her know that, by the way, if you need these things, yes, we have them. Your success is our success, obviously. Yes. I believe that even with people at other firms, we're perfectly willing to share, but definitely within the within the firm, just to know what's there. Right. And it was given to me not as a limitation. It wasn't here, you have to follow this form. No, it was, here's this form, make it your own, you know, build on it, but here's something to start with, you yeah. know, so that I had that ability just to, to not start with a, a blank piece of paper. I, I had something to, to work from and create from. You've done a really good job lately of getting really good money on cases. What are some things you've found that have helped you, you know, convince an insurance company to pay top value on a case? Just keep working it. I think that's really it. Just keep pushing it. Continue to follow the issues, look for new issues, look for pressure points, and just keep pushing the case. I, I think that's really that's really it. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's there on a case, sometimes it's not. But, you know, I always look for areas. Where else can I push? What else can I do here to keep pushing this case forward? I think that's a part. I think one of the biggest mistakes I used to make, and every now and then I'll slip, is someone will say, hey, let's go mediate this. Let's let's put off all the depots. Let's stop working on the case because let's go mediate it. And, and, and we'd agree to it because, you know, you want to save money. You want to not have to do the work. If you don't have to do the work, it makes sense. But then you're setting them the signal that you're there to pay, to take what they were there to pay. And I think the answer needs to be, if you want to step on the work, pay me now. If you don't want to pay me now, we're going to keep being ready for trial because, you know, we want a lot of money on this case. And if you're not ready to pay it, then we're going to try it. So let's keep working. If you want to stop spending money and stop doing the work, well, then let's start. We don't need to wait for mediation. Start making the offers. Right, right. Or just say, yeah, we'll, we'll mediate, but let's go ahead and get these depositions on the books. Let's yeah. go ahead and get these things scheduled so that you haven't put all your eggs in one basket. Exactly. You know? And then they, they also see that you are not, that your plan is not to go there and take whatever they offer. Right. Because that's what they expect. Right. Well, one of the things I really admire about you is you have the ability to really keep things organized and get a lot of things done. Because it's one of my big weaknesses. One of the Reasons I think our firm succeeds is because I find people to compliment me. I mean, I, there's areas where I'm not talented or just don't have an actual inclination. And I try to find people that have that. So one thing I'm awful at is keeping everything organized, follow up. Uh, you're really good at just keeping things going, not letting them fall through the cracks. How do you do that? 
Well, I, I try to do that as best as I can. Um, you know, I, I do make notes for myself. I do uh, each day write down the things that I need to get accomplished that day. And I take joy in crossing them off the list. <laughs> uh, but I also have a dry erase board where I put relevant deadlines, you know, expert deadlines, mediation deadlines, discovery deadlines, um, things that I need to be sure to get accomplished um, and so I have my, you know, short term goals and then my long term mm-hmm. goals. And so I think that keeps me oriented and moving forward, you know, with my day, but also with my week and, and the goals in the long run. It is interesting, even with all the computerized reminders we get, there's just something about having that visual where we can see it all the time and not that it pops up from time to time as a reminder really helps. There really is because I am an out of sight, out of mind person. So that's why I have to have things written down. Um, I have to have the list and it, it commits it to memory more for me to keep me focused on what the goals are that I need to accomplish that day. Now I've been told one of the more annoying things uh, about working for me are some of my roles, which are, you know, the, Monthly file reviews that are documented in writing, the monthly client call, the contact that's documented in writing, the report that has to be written and submitted 90 days before an expert deadline and uh, 90 days before trial. How much of a pain in the ass is it to do all that stuff that I'm asking you to do? Well, you know, it is it, it is <laughs> tough because it is time consuming, but they have a purpose, you know, and so that's where I value the purpose of it. And so I don't mind doing it because it has a purpose. Um, you know, the monthly file reviews are important to keep the cases moving forward um, because we can get, you know, totally consumed in one case. And then, well, what about all the others? Right. Um, and so those monthly file reviews are very important in continuing to keep the cases moving forward. And so, you know, it's important also, I feel for me to break up the cases so you don't have like your whole case docket, you're not reviewing it all at one time, but I, I make it more bite-sized, so to speak. I like to divide it into thirds so that it's more manageable at one time. And I feel like we are in a better position to accomplish the goals that we set at that monthly file review than if we did it in one lump review. Um, the client contacts are also important because people move, people cell phone changes, and the farther in time than you are that you are from when that happens, the the farther behind you are. So I think those client contacts are so very important, you know, just because you know life moves fast and we need to to stay with with the clients. And so you know all of those internal processes I think are important in moving the cases forward and not being surprised by deadlines. That's one of the things that I've liked being here is that you know I did used to you know wake up in the middle of the night thinking oh, when is that expert deadline or when is that whatever and now I don't because we have these systems and and they you know generate reminders and I find that helpful and more. Uh, lets me practice with less anxiety. <laughs> yeah, in the last six months between you know me working on Natalie's talking while she was on maternity leave and now me work, covering for Mallory while she's on maternity leave, I've had to follow my own rules uh, and do all these things. And, and I admit they're a pain in the butt, but then I remind myself why we have them and that if I could find a way not to have, I mean, I, I, you don't know what a struggle was for me to require a written report. I'm, what an insurance company would require reporting? But I can't find a better way to do it. I mean, the, the way if you don't think about your experts 90 days before the deadline or more, but I mean, for sure, 90 days before you're double checking everything, when are you going to do it? When it's too late? Right. If you right. don't think about 90 days for trial, who can show up? Do I need to make any exhibits? Do I need to do a, a trial deposition to somebody? When are you going to do it? When it's too late? When you're going to be panicked? And, you know, we just we don't make the panicked brain or the stressed out brain does not make good decisions. The panicked brain or the stressed out brain is not the best at being kind, loving, and respectful to those around us. Just there's something about just having that little bit of discipline, even to those of us where it doesn't come natural, and just realizing that, yes, it is a little bit of pain now, but it's going to save me from a lot of pain later. That's right. Yeah. And I I know some, you know, firms may have, um, you know, litigation team meetings or, you know, to prepare for trial, but, you know, this is another way to do it. And so it's 
whether you do it in a report or whether you do it in a litigation team meeting, you know, it, it really has to, to happen. Now, you've taken another step in your development. I mean, not only have you made partner, but now you have an associate. Yes. What are some, now you've got a great one. Yes. Uh, what are some of the uh, things you've learned that you find interesting about now you're having to develop someone else? Um, I do try to think of what would I have, you know, wanted, uh, what would I like for somebody to do? What would I want for someone to share with me? So that's what I, how I've, you know, tried to approach it. And, and he has some experience. And so, you know, he's very sharp, uh, and, and very smart. And so I just keep trying to keep it interesting for him. Cause you know, sometimes you can get bogged down in the everyday. So I just try to keep it interesting for him and, you know, look for new opportunities that he might enjoy. So what are some of the things you've done to try to make his life, uh, you know, better or help develop him? Well, you know, I do share him with another lawyer. So I do ask him, you know, like, how's your load? Um, do you need more stuff? Do you need less stuff? You know, I will ask him what he's doing. And so um, he has gotten to help me both trying to strike experts as well as responding to motions to exclude experts. And let's see, you know, also just jury charges so that he can, you know, start getting familiar with those because that's, you know, it really is the foundation of, of what we're trying to prove at the end of the day. So I figure, you know, let's let him already be thinking about those issues, you know, how we're going to present this to the jury um, the questions that we would want, the instructions we would want, those sorts of things. In your prior career, did you all work with any trial consultants or litigation strategists? Jury consultants, we would once in a while, and it was usually if co-counsel had a relationship with them already. And as far as litigation consultants, no, we we did not. And so that's been you know interesting to me. We usually stuck with you know our our trial lawyer. CLE opportunities, uh, which are good, but I just feel like there's been more varied opportunities here uh, that I've gotten to participate in. Yeah, I encourage everyone, you know, to the extent the budget allows, and of course they charge way too much, all of them charge way too much money, and they're never worth it, I think, hardly ever, unless you have some mega case, they're hardly ever worth it for the case, but they're worth it for the career, if that makes sense. I mean, the skills you learn, I mean, like we work with Ronnie Jew a couple Mm -hmm. Now, there's some cases where, you know, every case, I will say that we worked with them, we, we got our money back. I mean, we, we did very well in those cases. We picked the right cases, but I think he did help us add value. But I think the bigger value is that the skills we learn, both the, some of the critical thinking and strategy skills, and then the how to present our cases better visually mm -hmm. uh, that we learned from him. Now, we use that in case after case after case without having to go back and pay him even more ungodly sums of money. Right. Well, and I think Tom may have attended some courses or, you know, maybe he determined it on his own. And I learned, you know, some of that from him. So I can see similarities, but I know I didn't attend any of those. And, you know, part of it, too, may have been I started a family while I was working for Tom's firm. And so, you know, when you have little kids, it's harder to, to get out of town to, to go to things. But you know, I continue to practice and and, you know. and and I have friends question me like, why are you spending all this time and money, you know, educating? Like, aren't you afraid they're just going to leave? And, you know, what I said yesterday, and I really meant, I said, I really want a firm that everybody in town is trying to steal our people every day. Mm -hmm. I, I want every lawyer here to be recruited constantly that every other firm wants them. Uh, and then I also want them to not want to leave. To build yeah. a place that, you know, I'm not, no one's here because, well, you can't get any better or you can't go on your own and succeed. That You're here because we're providing a better place for you than you can get somewhere else. Now, I'm not saying that we're, we're not for everybody. And I'm not saying that I'm always going to succeed. I mean, we are it's a lot of people. Some people have the grass is greener syndrome. Some people just aren't going to like me uh, or aren't going are to get tired of what we do. And that's fine. But I at least want, you know, the goal to be. Everyone is really good so that everyone would want to take them, but then they're so happy that they don't want to go. But I'd rather have the risk of someone really good leaving than have a bunch of people that aren't that good working with me. Right, right. Well, and I think it, it matters, you know, the environment that is uh, set up, setting up the, um, the expectation and the desire for excellence. I think that 
is important. And I think that it's encouraging and it makes for an uplifting environment. Yeah, I want to you know, get some some mix between, you know, just letting things slide. And then the firm where I was at in New York when I was a baby lawyer where I got two assignments. One was from a partner and one was from a senior associate. And I worked till four in the morning and finished the partner's assignment. And I came in at about back of the office about 930 and I got reamed by the senior associate. She's like, when did you go home last night? I said, 4.30 in the morning. When did you get back here? About 9.30. So you had time to sleep. You had time to eat. You had time to shower. You had time to finish my project. You need to set your priorities if you want to make it this far. Yeah. Well, and that that's not enduring. You know, that no. that's not some place where somebody wants to stay, you know. And so, you know, that's, you know, where I think it's important to be in a, a workplace that is supportive and, but, you know, but will also challenge you and push you to get better. Yeah. It's finding yeah. that line to, of, right. of trying to hold that standard of excellence, but then not being a miserable. Yeah. Inhumane. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's a lot, of, a lot of it because there are times, I mean, we try to plan things out in advance. We try not to have last minute things. But frankly, there are times when we are working fast. There are times when we do have to work. I, this Saturday, uh, I, I take a lot of weekends off, but this Saturday I'm going down to Laredo, Texas to meet with witnesses and get them ready for you know a trial we have coming up in a little over a month. And again, it's because I don't want to be meeting with them the weekend before trial. I want to be meeting with them with enough time to develop their stories, to develop my own opening, and make sure that it's you know it's true mm-hmm. that, that what I think the, the story is 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 the story. Uh, and so sometimes we do have to do that. And I think making it pleasant when we do is an important part of it. And I don't mind working late. Not, I mean, I worked past midnight once in the last week, unfortunately. I mean, I went home to the little break, and I'm probably going to do the same tonight. Uh, but it's not an everyday thing. Uh, so I think, you know, just trying to find that balance between, yeah, you, we are going to work to midnight when we have to. Right. But we're also not going to do it just to do it. And we're also not going to be mean to each other and and doing and, and doing it, you know, you could be a sweatshop and make people work late every night, or make people. And I have some friends; they make the lawyers come in every Saturday. Uh, I just that's how they. It's their firm, and if that's how they want to have it, and people want to work there, I respect it. It's just not what I want to do. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to um, each person has to sort of figure out what they're willing to do. You know, I appreciate the flexibility to be able to do some work from home. You know, uh, there are times where I'll, you know, work during the day. And then once my kids uh, have gone to sleep, then I can work, you know, a little bit longer on something, especially if I have a deposition the next day, you know, I'm, I'm focused on that, that particular issue. Um, But other times I've, you know, done a deposition during the day and have some things I want to get done still that day. So then later that night, I'll work on those. So it's just, you you can't burn yourself out, you know, right. but you also have that desire to keep pushing things forward. And um, to some extent, I feel like people are more willing to work longer hours if extra hours aren't automatically required. I, right. I don't want to, I don't, you know, I know some folks I can see the value uh, to some extent of working on a Saturday, but I know how important Saturdays are for my family and with my kids. And so I will say that I believe I work harder for you during the week so that I can have my Saturdays. Right. So I think that's where there's a balance there. I I agree. And and like I said, I'll work a Saturday when I have to. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I no longer view it as a badge of honor. Oh, I worked past midnight. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I mean, frankly, I'm going to work past midnight tonight, and what I'm thinking is, you dumbass, you should have started to prep <laughs> a little earlier for this depot you have tomorrow, and then you wouldn't be having to work so late tonight. Uh, now, the other difference is I am still going to go home in a decent hour. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to have dinner with my family. I'm going to put my son to bed, and then I'm going to get back to work. Instead of staying here till like 10 or 11 and then, you know, feeling like the bad father and you know, not taking care of myself, you know, I'm, I'm going to find that balance. But, uh, and, and most of the time, it is a little self-imposed, but sometimes... You know, I'm going to have to work really late tonight because I wanted to take last week off. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and trial is a special time period. You know, there's not a trial every week, generally, for a case that's really going to go and then last a week, you know, in duration. And so, you know, it does sort of build up. And so, you know, I do push other things to the side when I'm preparing for trial, you know. Yeah. And, um, 
you know, of course, after the trial, then usually there's some makeup time where, you know, I have some downtime, at least try to get some downtime to come back from that. So it sort of all balances out. And how do you know? I know one thing I struggle with is balancing being a parent, being a spouse and being a lawyer. And, you know, and, and I'm trying to do all three at a high level. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm trying to be a really good lawyer, but I don't want to be a bad dad or a bad husband to be a good lawyer. Right. What are some things you found that have helped and or maybe you haven't? I have no idea. Yeah, no. I mean, I think it's an ongoing process that we as as lawyers and people and parents have. You know, I think it changes uh, with your kids and your kids' needs, you know, based on where they are and also with your spouse and your spouse's needs. Um, one of the things that I liked about my spouse or in that my spouse and I have in common is that we both are hard workers and we enjoy doing a good job and we enjoy being proud of the work that we do. And so we have that commonality. Even He's not a lawyer, but but we have that same value. And so in that way, it's easier for us to know where the other one is coming from when we do have to work late hours. So the other one picks up the slack, you know, with the kids and, and whatnot. But also it makes me want to be more hands-on because when I'm not in trial or not working on a deadline, then I need to have some time uh, with the kids too so that my spouse can do what he needs to do. Uh, And so I think it's just, you know, continuing to monitor sort of, so to speak, and assess, you know, what your kids need, what your spouse needs, and what you need. Because, you know, if you run yourself ragged and not taking care of yourself, that will catch up with you also. So I think it's, you know, a balancing of all of those. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm, I don't have the solution there. I'm, I'm, it's a constant struggle in my life of trying to balance out all the different things I do and be a good spouse and be a good parent. I'm, I try to remember Randy McGinn saying that you can have it all, you just can't have it all at the same time. <laughs> so, right. you know, yeah. I try to do, you know, block out really intense time to really neat fun things with my kids and also trying to make up the time just to be there for the little things because it's not just about the big moments but then you know in, in exchange that they, they're going to know that there's sometimes when i'm working late and that's just what it is i'm just trying to i'm just not do it every night right yeah and it's just do as much as as we can and i feel like it's important to me for my girls to see me working and mm-hmm. knowing that I'm working because, you know, I feel like girls need to know how to provide for themselves. And so, um, and men are great and women are great, but you know, we do need to be able to know how to provide for ourselves and, and have skills to provide for ourselves. So I think it's important for girls to have that example. Well, you, you're definitely doing a good job on your, on your part. So. Thank you. Well, Laura, thanks for, for talking. I know it's uh, it's always a little different to come in and talk, you know, in front of an audience. You can't see them, but, if, you know, a few thousand people listening <laughs> in on our conversation. Uh, but I do appreciate it. I love practicing with you. I'm so glad that you're here. I love to see, I mean, you came in as a good lawyer, but I've, I've, I've really enjoyed seeing your growth. And I really am looking forward to anticipation to see where you're going from here. Well, thank you. It's been a great environment to work in. I I thank you and I thank uh, Sonia and Mallory, the other partners, for the environment that y'all have all created. And um, I am I'm grateful to be here. And I thank God for this opportunity and the drive that He's placed in my heart to continue to to represent plaintiffs. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you'd like to receive updates, insider information, and more from Trial Lawyer Nation, sign up for our mailing list at triallawyernation.com. You can also visit our episodes page on the website for show notes and direct links to any resources in this or any past episode. To help more attorneys find our podcast, please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast on any of our social media outlets. If you'd like access to exclusive, plaintiff lawyer-only content, In live monthly discussions with me, send a request to join the Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle Facebook group. Thanks again for tuning in. I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. 
If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to delisi at cowanlaw.com. That's D-E-L-I-S-I at cowanlaw.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our host, guest, and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.